Are we good to go? We're good to go. Pictures taken? All right. Uh, hi, my name is James Hackney, Dean of the Law School. I think I taught at least some of you at some point, perhaps of course. But uh, welcome. This program dates back to 2006 when we held a highly successful labor and employment conference spearheaded by Mark Irvins. Mark continues to be the driving force behind this annual program, and we are so proud of his accomplishments, including serving as arbitrator between Major League Baseball and the Major League Baseball Players Association. Our long history of producing top labor and employment attorneys stems no doubt from Matthews University Distinguished Professor of Law. I thought if I said his entire uh, <laughs> title, he'd uh, show up in time, but he's not quite <laughs> here yet. Carl Clare's leadership and reputation in the field. I'm sure he's on his way, along with amazing adjunct faculty such as Ira Sills. Of course, as you all know, in the world of labor law, Carl is uh, revered. This year, we'll hear from speakers on two topics. First, uh, Janice, a death knell or wake up call for unions. And second, evolving issues in the workplace and the courts for LGBTQ and non-binary workers. We're fortunate again this year to have Morgan Brown and Joy sponsor the post panel networking reception, which allows for further discussion of the topics covered and meaningful interactions with fellow practitioners. Thank you to Jackie Cagell and Joe McConnell for your firm's support for this worthwhile post event. Special thanks to Mark Irvings, Joe McConnell, and Ira Sills for serving as the advisory planning committee for this year's program. A collective thank you to the Office of Development and Alumni Alumni Relations, and of course to Mia Marquis for her work planning and managing this event. Again, welcome, and I turn it over to Mark. Thank you very much. Okay, um, our first panel uh, is about Janice. Um, it became even more timely today. There was an article in the Globe about suit being filed by a worker, or on behalf of a worker, by a uh, national committee, a worker at BC, uh, an electrician who is alleging that um, as a Muslim, he has a deeply held religious belief that precludes him from supporting a union. Um, so it's a topic that's yeah, in the papers, not just from the pu public sector, uh, but from the private sector potentially as well. Um, we are missing one panelist, uh, Desiree. We're hoping we'll find her way here. We may strike from her web page that she gives guidance, at least not <laughs> But uh, we'll get started. Um, I don't remember who's going to be here. Okay. Uh, Sheila McCarthy of the firm of Leno McCarthy, uh, representing uh, public and private? Mostly public unions? Yeah, mostly public unions. Okay. And then Ira Fader, who is the general counsel still. You haven't yet retired, but you're close. Okay. <laughs> of the Mass Teachers Association, um, who will speak about the impacts uh, in those two worlds. So, Sheila, take it away. Thank you. Um, so, getting to know you. Um, show of hands, how many of you are labor lawyers? Put those hands right up there. Be proud! Be proud! Uh, okay, um, and how many of you, who've just had your hands in the air, are union side labor lawyers? <laughs> okay. All right. And so, uh, let me see again. How many of you are representing management? Okay. And 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 are there any students, law students, in the room? Oh wow. Okay. Are you out on co-op now? Um, great. And um, well, are you doing labor co-ops now? Show your hands for labor co-ops. Great. Okay. Well. Um, that's all I got. I, uh, <laughs> I, I've been advising and representing 
unions since 1991. Um, some data points that I find interesting, actually, just looking at the uh, brochure, um, is that um, it turns out, well, first of all, Abood, which, which Janice overturned, overruled, um, was issued on my birthday. So. <laughs> um, I won't tell you how old I was in 1977, but I can tell you that that was the year that Iris Sills graduated from law school. So <laughs> I know that because of the brochure, unless, it, unless there's a typo, which I suspect there is. I suspect there may be a typo there. But, oh, but Ira, it, you were such a kid. <laughs> hard to believe, but the, the, the reason I, so I was in class of 91, and I remember taking Iris' class and then Carl Clare's class, and talking about a boot and it felt new at that point, and now it feels like my career. <laughs> and um, so 41 years later, um, the day the earth stood still, um, the United States Supreme Court overruled that decision on June 27th, 2018. And my, my, I've been asked to just sort of give you a primer, I guess, on Janice, and then also talk to you a little bit about what's happened in Massachusetts legislatively, statutorily, since Janice. And then I'm going to turn it over to Ira. And so before I do that, I need to manage your expectations further um, by saying that every superhero needs a sidekick, and you can just consider me this superhero's sidekick. Um, <laughs> because uh, I'm really not even worthy of being on the same in the same panel with him on this, especially on this topic. So, um, but in any event, Janice, who's read it? Um, who's read it this week? Uh, it's uh, an amazing uh, intellectual exercise. Um, the, the, um, it's also a study in, and actually reading Abood again and reading Janice and seeing the difference in tone is, fa is fascinating too. So Abood, which was you know, issued in 1977, had no dissenting uh, um, opinions. It was, um, there were three concurring opinions, um, but it was written, uh, it, it, the, the, the justices seemed to get along pretty well at the time, and even Rehnquist had a, wrote a, a brief concurring opinion. Um, but fast forward to Janus, and it was, I'm sure you can guess, five to four, um, with the uh, five conservatives um, voting um, with the majority, and obviously the, 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 the dissent, the main dissent, was written by um, Justice Kagan. So I guess the, the, the primer, let's, let's get to the basics. Um, this was um, the, a, a situ the case came out of um, Illinois, right? I'm already forgetting my geography. Um, and uh, an employee, actually um, the governor, um, sought, to, um, sought to overturn the, the statute that permitted unions and public employers, public employee unions and employers, to um, enter into agreements to take agency fees um, from people who elected not to be part of the union, not to be union members. Um, but, but they held bargaining unit positions. So the, the statute enabled the employer and the union to agree to an agency fee clause, and that basically provided that if you didn't pay, if you weren't a union member paying dues, then you were going to be a non-member paying an agency fee. And the governor thought that that was a violation of people's constitutional rights, and eventually a guy named Mark Janus said, yeah, I think so too. And he, he sought to intervene in the case. Um, and then eventually the governor's lawsuit was tossed out um, on, you know, on the grounds that he didn't have standing. But Janice was permitted to basically become, um, become the plaintiff in that case. Um, and ultimately, the Supreme Court held that, in fact, agency fees violate the First Amendment. Um, or violate the non-members First Amendment, the non-union members First Amendment rights. Um, the uh, the specific holding um, was 
that neither an agency fee nor any other payment can be uh, to a public sector union can be deducted, um, nor may they attempt to um, be made co to collect a payment unless the employee <laughs> affirmatively consents to the payment. So the way that Justice Alito, who wrote the majority opinion, frames this is that it's basically being, people are being compelled um, against their rights to pay for the speech of an entity that they don't agree with. And the speech, the, the entity, specifically the way that Alito frames it, is that, the, that it is the speech of the union that they, they disagree with and that therefore they should not be forced to, um, to pay for that speech. Um, Justice Kagan sees the sees the uh, the case entirely differently. Of course, um, the the they can agree on real basics. For example, um, Justice Alito says the, uh, the the cases that govern First Amendment the First Amendment rights of public employees is, don't apply here. Those cases are are inapposite, as he says. Um, and whereas Justice Kagan says, well, it's not, this is not a, an identical twin to those cases, but it's a fraternal twin, and therefore the analysis of those, those cases does apply. Um, ultimately, though, uh, obviously, four, five votes beats four votes, and that's why we now have a situation where unions are no longer able to get any to, to compel, if you will, um, any <coughs> financial contribution from people who've elected not to be members of the union, um, because the, and obviously I'm talking public sector, um, because the US Supreme Court has deemed that that is a violation of their First Amendment rights. So um, Massachusetts, fortunately, uh, said, okay, uh, we, we, we now have to tackle this um, and, and deal with the repercussions, um, the aftermath of, of Janus, because, I mean, public employee unions in Massachusetts, by and large, had agency fee clauses in their contracts, which meant that they were, that they're not, the people who had elected not to be union members were making some <coughs> contribution toward the, the uh, union's um, financial health and unfortunately with, with the Janus decision they were unable to continue to extract those or to collect those those um, payments. But in to the legislature the heroes of this story went and um, we as of September 19th 2019 so quite recently um, a, an emergency law was enacted over the veto of Governor Baker um, that provides for a number of, um, well, a number of measures that, that I guess you could argue might take the sting out of the Janus decision. Um, I'll take them in order just to walk you through the law, the new law, um, but it, so it's not in order necessarily of importance, but, but they're all very, they're, they're, helpful and, and um, you know, uh, well, helpful and um, obviously it remains to be seen how helpful because we, it just went into effect, but um, it, it certainly is, is, is not going to hurt. Um, the, the first one, actually the first section of the new law, and by the way, it's, it's the acts of, it's chapter 73 of the acts of 2019. Um, the, the first section of the new law amends uh, the public records law specifically Section 10B of Chapter 66, um, by, by specifically providing that the home address, the personal email address, the home phone, and the personal cell phone number of an employee is not a public record. So it specifically says this, this information is not a matter of public record. So not doesn't have to be disclosed pursuant to a public records request. Um, but then it goes on to say it may be disclosed to an employee organization, which is you know, obviously a union. Um, and it also provides for a nonprofit 
or a, a nonprofit organization for retired employees or a criminal justice agency are also entitled to access to this information. So, in other words, what this law has done is it said that unions are entitled, public sector unions um, are entitled to that information, home address, personal email, home phone, and mobile phone for, for public employees. Um, the, the last part of the last section of that of that amend, part of the amendment of the law um, specifically says that family member information, so family member address, phone number, etc., is not public record. Um, I assume that that's probably was probably something that somebody thought of and was some kind of a compromise or some concern about, about the privacy of family members. But in any event, um, unions are now entitled to this information, and I gather that the subtle importance of the first part of, the, of, of this new section, um, new language, is that it's not information that other organizations can get. Um, for example, um, an organization that might be interested in reaching out to people to try to incentivize them to quit their union. Um, the other, the next two sections of the new law are actually um, make, are, make changes to Chapter 150E, which is the Public Employee Collective Bargaining Law here in Massachusetts. So first, they, it adds two new paragraphs to, to, the, to the existing Section 5 of the law, and then the next section actually adds a new Section 5A. So let me walk you through that. So section five of, of, uh, of, the, of the existing chapter 150E is amended by adding two paragraphs. Um, this is probably, is, has probably been held up as, as the most um, important post Janus change for, um, in terms of the expectations of how it will create the appropriate incentives. Um, for people, but it, it, it basically says that non-members, so people who have elected not to be union members, can, um, can be charged by the union reasonable costs and fees, including the arbitrator's fees, which, you know, um, and related attorney's fees um, for, for, that are incurred in the, co in the context of grieving or arbitrating a matter and that the union can actually require the non-member to pay up front. So they basically, you know, and the way it's worded, it says the exclusive representative, which is obviously a reference to the union, may require a non-member to pay any anticipated proportional costs and fees prior to a grievance or arbitration hearing. Um, and then, here's, the, here's the, uh, the icing on the cake, failure to pay costs and fees shall relieve the exclusive representative of further responsibility to the non-member regarding the matter. Um, this, this actually addresses the, 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 the real connection between the, the duty of fair representation, which the, the majority in Janus wants to disregard um, as unimportant. Um, you know, they repeatedly say that there's no link between um, between the, uh, the, the exclusive representation and the agency fee, but they, the only way that they can make that assertion is essentially, in my opinion, by ignoring the duty of fair representation. Um, the next paragraph in, in the next new paragraph in section 5, 150E, um, provides, speaks to the duty of fair representation, it says an exclusive Representative's duty of fair representation to a public employee who is in the bargaining unit shall be limited to the negotiation and enforcement of the terms of the agreement um, with the public employer. And, and then it goes on to say the law does not prohibit an employee organization from providing to its members, so not the people who've elected not to be not be to be part of the union, but for its members, many unions provide other benefits, legal, economic, job, you know, just, and the, so it's listed, legal, economic, or job-related services or benefits outside the collective bargaining agreement. So, in other words, this section, this new paragraph in section five, it, it seeks to clarify that the duty of fair representation as it applies to non-members is very specifically um, limited to the negotiation and enforcement of the, collect of the terms of the collective bargaining agreement. <coughs> 
Um, the new section, Section 5A, um, has a lot of um, a lot of subsections, but spe and specifically, it's it's really a section that provides um, a union with access, not just to its members, but to all bargaining unit employees. Um, it, it 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 there's a whole list of the different um, forms of access the union has, but it's it's entitled to. Um, have individual meetings with um, with members during or with employees during the day during the work day um, to investigate and discuss grievances, workplace related um, complaints, and other workplace issues. It's allowed to have group meetings um, during non-work hours um, on the work site uh, to talk about. Uh, workplace issues, collective bargaining negotiations, the administration of the collective bargaining agreement, and other matters related to the duties of the exclusive representative, including internal union matters. Um, it also provides the, the union with access to information about new hires, which I love. Um, a lot of the, I represent a lot of small bargaining units, and. A, a lot of times they're not great at staying on top of the employer and having systems in place. And um, so I'm looking forward to training my unions to um, get, get on their, the employer about getting this information. But um, specifically it says that, that the union has the right to meet with newly hired employees without charge to pay or leave time for that employee for not less than 30 minutes and not later than 10 calendar days after the date of hire of the new employee. So that's, that's an, a, a, a nice addition to the law. Um, they, the the uh, new section also provides that not later than 10 calendar days after, and this is specific to school employees, not later than 10 calendar days after the date of a prospective school employee, after they accept an offer of employment, um, the public employer ha shall provide them, shall provide the union with the contact information. Um, and, in, and it's supposed to be in a spreadsheet format or some other agreed upon format. And it, they have to give them, they have to give the union the new, the, the new employee's name, job, job title, work site location, home address, work telephone number, home and personal cell phone, um, date of hire work email address and personal email address. So this is, this is you know, sort of the, the um, nuts and bolts of organizing is to be able to get in touch with your employees. And if there's anything we know in the post Janus world, it's that um, organizing is everything. Um, so uh, the law also provides that the employer has to Within 10 days of hire for for other for other public employees. So so basically that section of the law kind of splits off school employees. The notice has to be within 10 days of the date of accepting employment that the employee accepted employment or accepted uh, the offer of employment. With all other public employees, the, the the notice has to be within 10 days of the date of hire. But it's access to all of this information, which you know is really. Um, the lifeblood of, a, of, of, an or, of an organization, any organization, is to be able to reach your members. Um, it also provides, the new, new uh, Section 5A also provides that the exclusive representative has the right to use the email system of the public employer to communicate with bargaining unit members regarding union-related matters, including but not limited to elections, election results, meetings, and social activities. Um, I really love that section. I have had, uh, represented a, an awful lot of unions that have gotten a lot of grief from the public employer for using the email, which um, you know I haven't yet seen how it has, how how it affects um, how it adversely affects or burdens the employer in any way. But they love to uh, hassle the unions about using their their email system. Um, the exclusive. Uh, representative also has the right to conduct meetings um, in the building, in, in, so you know obviously we're talking about public public buildings, um, and um, they're they're now allowed specifically given the right to use government buildings um, under this section of the statute. So and obviously uh, any violation of these new you know codified 
rights the union has would, would be an, um, a prohibited practice under um, um, 10A5. So um, that's, that's basically the gist of the new section, section 5A. Um, the next section basically incorporates many of those changes, specifically the, the right to recover reasonable fees, costs and fees, um, including the arbitrator fees and the and attorney fees from um, uh, unions, the, the MBTA unions. Um, and finally, um, yeah, so that, that is, that's the gist of the, the new law. Um, and I, you know, again, it's, it's a baby. It's <coughs> September 19, 2019. We don't have um, any, well, at least I don't have any data on um, how, what's happened or whether there's been any, um, I, I, obviously it seems very unlikely that there's any litigation um, pending yet under this, but maybe there is. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all, it, we're in a brand new regime and a new world, a new world or order. And I'm going to turn it over to Ira now to talk about um, what's happened in litigation since Janice. Before you get to that, let me just ask one question. Do you have a sense of how the section that says that the unions are responsible for negotiating and enforcing the collective bargaining agreement, how that plays with the right to, if a non-member doesn't pay for the arbitration, they don't get access to an arbitration. Do you see those as potentially inconsistent? It's, it's a complicated area, and I can touch on that. As okay, a, as go a right ahead then. Um, so I'm Ira Fader, um, and uh, interesting that you, you know, you remind me that Abood is 1977. I went to a union meeting as a young guy working in some place in 1978. Uh, and I had no idea it was going to completely change the course of my life. And so 41 years later, it's time to bring the meeting to an end. And that's why I'm retired in January. <laughs> that's a long meeting. But um, uh, let me put a, a sort of a larger frame around, around all of this. Um, and I'm going to be maybe non-legal in my assessment of uh, the Janus case. And then, uh, because it, it, you have to understand that the Janus case was nothing but a political decision by the Supreme Court of the United States. And in fact, it was, it, it was a political decision. It was an unprincipled decision. Um, and uh, and it's, um, it's, it's kind of stunning in the nakedness of its, of its politics. And the very nice things you said about me, but Mr. Superhero, I'm the guy who actually predicted that the court would not overturn a boot. I thought, there's no way the court will go down this road and, and completely throw out star decisis. We had a 41-year or 42-year-old decision, whatever it was, that was a unanimous decision of the Supreme Court, including some pretty conservative justices, that had become embedded throughout the constitutional um, uh, and the decisional case law in the federal courts and in the state courts. Um, in thousands of cases, uh, it had been cited. Um, and it also was a matter of really states' rights, right? 25 states had decided as a matter of the or way in which they want to organize their own relationship with their own employees that they want to be able to allow unions through the statute that they enacted to have an agency fee in a collective bargaining agreement. So this states' rights, you know, anti-federal government court decides that it's gonna turn 25 states that are that are not right to work states into right to work states. It federalized right to work. A stunning political decision that the Congress never would have done because there would have been no there would have been no appetite for it. And that this 25 state legislatures had not had also not done. And one might think in some places that went right to work states that it might flip back. There have been some changes, right, in some of the states. Um, back to democratic control. And we might see the, the removal of right to work um, uh, both you know, for the public sector employees. But no, this, this Supreme Court determined that it was gonna function as some kind of super legislature and decide every, the entire country will be right to work for all of its public employees. Um, that's a stunning thing for the Supreme Court to do. I never thought Justice Roberts would, would join the, the four 
you know, the, you know, the four uh, right wingers on the court. Uh, but he did, and will, I frankly, it will be his sh a shame and a black mark on his legacy. That is spoken as someone who deals with Janice all the time, and I also do remember that most people have no idea what Janice is, and so the black mark might not be seen by most of the rest of the world, um, except, for the, the, except for lawyers and except for legal historians. And the idea of overturning court decisions is something this court is doing with greater regularity now, and that too is stunning. It's really, it's undermining the stability of the court, and it's, it's, a, and it's a real problem. Um, a further political background. This isn't just a conservative court that decided Janice. This was a well-financed attack that had been coming for years. Janice was preceded by Friedrichs. Um, another case brought by, I think that was brought by the right to work. This was, there's all of these extremely well-financed right-wing um, groups out there. And financed by you know the um, you know by the billionaires, quite frankly, uh, you know by the Koch brothers, um, and um, and and, uh, and they have think tanks. They have the American Legislative Exchange Council. There's a very powerful right wing machine out there that's looking to undo lots of different kinds of progressive um, uh, achievements of the last 20 or 30 years, and um, and this group is profoundly anti-union. The National Right to Work is one of those entities, and they're profoundly anti-union. And these are the groups that brought Friedrichs, and then when Justice Scalia died, and Friedrichs died along with him, uh, the next case was Janice. There just was another one waiting in the, in the wings uh, to be brought forward. And so again, a, a well-financed right-wing attack on the public sector unions, because they had already harmed through all kinds of legislative and court decisions, the power of the unions in the private sector. And now they have to take down the public sector. And so going after a union's, a public sector union's financial security seemed like a brilliant way to do it. And that's what Janice is about. It's about undermining union financial security. Agency service fee was really designed for the, for the because non-members uh, in a regime of collective bargaining in which the union must, is compelled, talk about being compelled by the, by the law, is compelled to represent everyone in the bargaining unit, including non-members. We're compelled to represent those non-members, and we, bring, we take them on. We say, fine, we'll represent you, because we do, we're representing the entire bargaining unit, and we're actually representing the collective bargaining agreement, so we will represent members and non-members alike. But the agency fee was a way of saying, You've got, you the non-member, you don't have to join our association. You do have that First Amendment right. We're not gonna compel your association with us. Um, but you will have to pay for the costs, not of our political activities, but the costs of our collective bargaining activities because you're gonna get the benefit of that. You'll be able to bring a grievance under this collective bargaining agreement. You're gonna get the salary increase that we're gonna wind up negotiating with, and you're not paying for it. And you're a free rider, is what, we, is what is the phrase that was used. And so this was a way of addressing free riding. And free riding is actually an economic principle, you know, outside of, outside of collective bargaining. Um, there's Kate Shea, who uh, I'm happy to see you. Um, the other co-author, in a sense, of the legislation with me that you have just, you know, that you've just reviewed. Um, so, um, <clears throat> What was I saying? So how are, they, yeah. how are you guys but, dealing with it? Yeah, all right. So um, what the union is doing, I've lost my train of thought there. So um, what the union has done in response to this attack um, uh, from, uh, from uh, the court and the right wing is this. What well, I can speak for my union. We hired 10 new organizers because you're correct. It's all about organizing, 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 organizing. And so we've hired 10 organizers. We previously didn't have an organizing division. And over the summertime, we hired 90 organizers on, on a temporary basis. To, um, and this was all before the legislation uh, passed. Because what we're, and we're kind of retrofitting so that we're gonna be trying to reach out through our, uh, through our um, um, uh, structure, through our affiliation structure to each and every member, because anyone who's ever done organizing knows the one-on-one -on -one communication is critical. That's how you get people to join. You ask them, you meet with them, you say, what, what are you thinking? 
about your workplace. What are the problems you're having? Join, join this union because you will have a voice in the union um, by joining. And um, even though we had mostly all of the teachers and all of the university professors that we represent ha have joined in years past, what we know Janice is really about, the cancer that is Janice, is that people can do, oh, I was talking about the free rider problem, that people can decide, well, I can either pay the dues here, which are somewhere between $700 and $1,000 or whatever, whatever it is, or I can pay nothing and get, and free ride, and get the same benefits. Why wouldn't I just do that? that and that's, and the right wing has this wealth finance campaign, give yourself a raise. That's what they do. As soon as Janice passed, they started sending a blitz of emails to public sector employees, even in, in Massachusetts. Uh, saying, give yourself a raise. And that's part of the reason why in that legislation, there's a provision that makes uh, the, 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 the addresses, the public email addresses of public employees not a public record. Because we, we don't want it to be so easy for the, you know, for, you know, some, for the Mackinac uh, Foundation out of Michigan to come in here and start sending people, give yourself a raise, drop membership. We want to, you know, that's n the Massachusetts legislature has decided that collective bargaining is the best way to regulate and to organize the, you know, the terms and conditions of employment for its employees. Um, so we've been doing a lot of uh, a lot of organizing um, on the legislative end. Yes, we were, you know, the MTN, all of the unions were joined into a coalition that worked very hard uh, to get this bill passed. We were put into a box, frankly, by the legislature, uh, by the Speaker of the House, who said, um, all the unions have to be on board. Well, good luck you know, getting all the unions to agree to any one thing. Um, and we met, uh, what would you say, a million times or two million times in large groups, and it was very hard to get everybody on board. Um, but eventually we did. Um, and the legislature knew in, you know, liberal Massachusetts, you know, um, that it was going to need to respond, and other legislature, legislatures around the country have responded legislatively, um, and pass this, this bill. To me, the centerpiece of this bill are those access rights you were talking about. Yeah. Because as I said about organizing, now <coughs> this enables us to, to do meaningful organizing, including getting the names of new employees for teachers if they get hired in June to start in, in September, we get their name and their contact information in June. We don't have to wait for them to start in September so that we can <coughs> talk to them over the, over the summer. The, the Supreme Court took away our economic security of, uh, of um, the agency fee. And what this bill was, every part of this bill was designed to kind of replace that, that taken away economic security with organizing security. That's what this thing really is about. And if, as you look through all of these, they protect us in our ability to reach members so that we can talk to them. Whether it's through the employer's email system, whether it's at their home addresses, whether it's in <coughs> orientation sessions, you know, uh, whether it's at new employee, uh, you know, uh, new employee hiring meetings, the legislature said the union can have access. That access is a form of security for us. And then last, I know I'm probably running out of time, but. Um, that's never stopped me before. Um, there, there is the, the litigation, and I, I, I really do need to mention what's going on um, as part of this right-wing attack. And I, I am really not exaggerating um, when I describe it as a right-wing of a national attack on us. Um, and right here in Massachusetts, there is a case now that's pending before the United States Supreme Court involving three of the MTA's local affiliates in which, against the natural right to work, they've brought this case. And what they're saying is, okay, now in the post-Janus world, you can't force me to be a member of your union, but you know what, You're, you, are, you, the MTA, are violating my non-member constitutional rights. Still, how are we doing that? Because what we say to non-members is, we will represent you in the grievance process, we will even represent you in the arbitration process, and send you a lawyer for that arbitration. But what you don't have the right to do is come to our ratification meetings, and you don't have the right, this shouldn't be a big surprise, to run for office 
in the union as a non-member. You don't have association rights. This is an association of people freely joining together, and frankly, we have First Amendment rights not to be involved with you, but we will live with that as part of our duty of exclusive representation and duty of our privilege of exclusive representation, not duty of fair representation. Um, and that's what right to work is now litigating against us, and it's at the Supreme Court. We, we won at the Department of Labor Relations. We won before the, uh, the Supreme Judicial Court. Not surprisingly, because there actually is a case, the Knight case out of Minnesota, that makes it clear that exclusive representation is not unconstitutional. That putting people into a big bargain unit and saying one union will represent everyone in that unit is not an unconstitutional compelled association. But that's what they're attacking. Um, and so that's the voice and vote issue is one issue. We're waiting, we just today, right to work filed its reply brief, and now we're waiting for the Supreme Court to, to tell us whether it's gonna take cert, this was a petition for certiorari, and they gonna, are they gonna take it up? It takes only four votes, and we know who the four are, um, and um, we'll see if, if Justice Roberts, you know, uh, we'll see what happens with that case. But there's litigation all over the rest of the country. As of last May, there were 84 cases pending in the federal courts uh, in which, uh, the v different groups were challenging, were saying Janice was, was decided in June, so we want to get back all of the agency service fees that our people paid in all the years before Janice, because when the court says something's unconstitutional, it's unconstitutional for all time. Going forward, going back, it's totally unconstitutional. So we want our fees back. And dues. Uh, and, and, and do, yeah, and then there's an attack on dues. It's, you know, they've lost every one of those so far. This, you know, there are, um, there, are, there are cases in the courts about membership cards, saying anybody who signed a union membership card prior to Janus, should, the union should be forced to get them to sign again because you can't assume that they signed the membership card understanding their rights. So those cases thus far has failed. Um, I, I really could go, there's an antitrust violation against you. It's just one thing after the next. Um, and it seems right now that the federal courts, at least, don't have an appetite to go beyond where Janus went. And it may be that you're starting to see a, a shift back. I, although I was the hopeful guy who thought Roberts wouldn't be the jerk that he turned out to be, I'm still the hopeful guy who thinks that that unions are actually going to start coming back. We see it with the, with, the, with the spread of teacher strikes in places where they don't have bargaining rights and in places where they do have bargaining rights, like right here in Dedham. And everybody was watching that Dedham teacher strike. Um, and I, 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 the, the, the polling about unions is better than it's ever been. I'm somewhat hopeful. Um, and, um, you know, now it's that if Janice has had any effect, we have not lost members, by the way. Our membership went up after Janice. Um, and so if Janice has had any effect, it's in sort of angering the unions, maybe poking the, the beast that, to the extent it was asleep, and, um, and just being part of this right-wing attack, this you know, income inequality country that people seem to be getting really, really tired of. And we'll see what happens in 2000 and whatever it is that Trump is going to do. Um, so that's Thank what you. I got. So Desiree, now for the management perspective, I do wonder, as I heard the list of things in that bill, about how many of your clients would gladly trade agency fee to get back that grab bag of new rights that the oh, teams have written into the Right, bill. I mean, I think, you know, a, a couple of things. I, I agree with Ira on the fact that uh, Janice is a political decision. Okay. I also agree <laughs> that it turned a well-established issue on its head. What I don't agree with <laughs> is how public employers have been put in the middle of something that traditionally isn't something we've wanted to negotiate. We've never really wanted to negotiate the relationship between the unions and the employees. It's been something that, you know, obviously it's a subject of bargaining, so if it comes up, we have to talk about it. We, want to, we have to administer the dues. If it's a provision in the contract, that's, you know, what we've done. When it comes to agency shop provisions, you know, an employer can push back, but if the union's sticking on that agency shop provision, then, you know, it's not something we're gonna necessarily die on a contract with, so it goes in the contract. Um, but again, has it been something that an employer, a public employer has been like, okay, this is our battle to fight and this is something that we have to, you know, keep a close watch over? No, it's something that, again, it's mandatory to bargain over. If it's something that is a very, you know, strong sticking point, you 
put it in the contract. And I think, especially in a place like Massachusetts, where your collective bargaining relationships are spanning 20 and 30 years, that's embedded not only just in you know, that initial contract, but just in how the parties operate. So here comes this decision that turns all that on its head, and again, forces employers who have these provisions in their agreement to figure out what are we supposed to do. And again, we've never had to do anything around this, so now we have to figure out how to talk about this. And I can tell you from our perspective, a lot of what we did was try to find that guidance, give them that guidance, right? What can you tell employees about you know, what they need to do in terms of you know, electing or opting out of the agency fees? And how do we do that, mindful of the relationship that these guys have with their union and their bargaining representative, but also mindful of the First Amendment rights that Janice you know, is pumping up now, right? Um, so again, you have this awkward situation um, where we're you know, giving people the information, the baseline information that they need, and then comes this bill, which again, puts us square in the middle of navigating what access um, the union has to employees. When Janice wasn't really, like you said, an access issue, it was an economic issue. So now we've jumped further and now we're reaching over into, okay, well, now we have these lists of, you know, information that you traditionally wouldn't give. You wouldn't give folks their personal emails and phone numbers. We would generally say, no, we're not gonna hand that over. But now that's very much you know, gonna be the standard as well as changing, again, how we've approached access issues on the workplace and the public uh, access to public emails is a big one, right? Um, and again, I think what, it, what, this, what this law and what Janice has done, again, is put public employers in a position where we're having to navigate things that, again, we wouldn't ordinarily wanting to have our fingers so deep in with it was in. And I think, you know, doing an informal survey amongst my office, we, like you said, haven't seen a significant impact in, you know, this decision decreasing the numbers of folks who are in unions. And again, I think that's because you're talking about relationships that are decades old. So there's not really necessarily, I think, I mean, I think you're right that Janice came out and made, you know, a lot of union folks angry. But I also don't think that it necessarily reached the common bargaining unit member as all of a sudden I don't have to do this, right? I don't think that's what it did. And I think you're right, people don't really know what Jane is. Yeah, well, it didn't make us angry at the employers. Right, you, no, you and that's, that's, exactly, but yet we're in the middle of this law. Like, that's the thing, and it's like, okay, again, how are we going to navigate this when a, an area that we traditionally, again, have only touched on when we have to in a sense of, again, we have a contract provision that we bargain for, that we have to administer, but we're not necessarily the gatekeepers of who's in the union and who's not. You tell us. That's always been an, uh, any employer, not just public employer's position when it comes to you know, who's going to be you know, a full-fledged bargaining member, who's going to just do agency fees. I mean, I guess that's the, the nuts and the bolts of it. I mean, we're in an awkward situation where, again, now we're going to have to take a step further and change over again how we dealt with the issue of access in the workplace and information giving that we give to the union. I think this law, you know, I think it's overreaching in a lot of ways on employers. I really do. I think it puts us in a place where, again, what was an economic decision, like you pointed out, now becomes an access issue where I don't know that public employers were seeing that access issue actually be a problem. That it shouldn't be a problem. Well, <laughs> when you add in a whole bunch of new stuff, it is a problem. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, employers have a you know a, a sort of standoff on the side here. We um, always, yeah, exactly. You know, because and you know a lot of what I've said to employers is, but you know, when, when they're wondering what do I do now, it's like my message is stay out of this problem. This is you know, first of all, we've made it easy for you at the MTA. We are not collecting agency <laughs> services from anyone. So right. don't, if if they're you know it, voluntary you know consensual, we're not accept. If someone wants to pay something called a fee, we're going, no, right. you get to join or you get to drop. And right. we think if you, if you drop, you're making a serious mistake. Right. Because you should be part of this brotherhood and sisterhood with all the people who let you, who you work with. We're, not, we're trying to flip the non-members into membership. We're not offering any kind of voluntary agency mm -hmm. fee. So you can remove it from all of your contracts. <laughs> and don't, put, don't say that I said that. That's <laughs> <laughs> recorded. You have this. Like, well, we, we, we removed it from our MTA bylaws. You know, we're, you, you know, we're simply not collecting the agency fee until the, some future Supreme Court overturns Chavis and returns to the <coughs> Right, but I feel like this bill keeps us from being able to stay out of it. Because again, we're going to have to rethink about our systems in terms of how we 
give information. What again with new hires? That's a completely different process than I think most public employers have approached the issue of what information you give to a union at what time. Well, one nice thing because some of these, some of the things that are in this law are are things that have been bargained by unions and are in contracts. So, I would submit that you have now got a standardized approach. You don't have to worry about what the contracts say. They're all over the map, right? No, no, it's right here in the statute now. And so you've now got a very standardized approach. So just playing you know, the flip side of that, it, in, in some ways from an administrative standpoint, from a management standpoint, this should be now easier for you to So what that. happens, there's some piece of it that um, they don't provide a meeting of 30 minutes with the new employee. Mm -hmm. Now, do you go to court? No, less than 30 minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> do you go to court? Because that's, that's not a contract provision now. Oh, right. it's an unfair labor practice. It's oh, a unfair unfair labor yeah. practice. Yeah, you go to the DOL. But, so, well, so yeah. but you I, take it all out of the grievance procedure, and now you're going to have to well, sit for years at the DOL. What, what it means is the employer can't go to the table and say, no, I'm not going to allow these things. No, I'm not going to oh, grant you access. Well, to the I email. think that's right. I think yeah. that's right. But so. again, I, I, I disagree with you that these things are in the contract and kind of standard. Because again, I don't no, know. No, no, that, that's what I'm saying is that they, maybe I was inarticulate, but. They are in lots. They're in lots of the contracts that I bargain. You'll have the you know right to meet with union members for whatever you know. There there are you'll find these types of rights mm -hmm. in collective bargaining agreements, but it's a mishmash. It's all over the landscape. Right. This right. standardizes it. That's because it's the, every one of them were mandatory subjects to begin with. Right. There was nothing in here that you didn't have. You could have just said, "Oh, I don't even want to talk about that." Right. Every one of the the rights in the new bill was a mandatory subject, and now it's saying, "You know what? We're not going to leave these things to you know, you know to, the, to the bargaining table. Mm -hmm. We, the legislature, are going to make it the law." So you, you have to do these things. Right, but again, to the extent that oh. we, <laughs> that's what it is, folks. That's the law. Well, uh, <laughs> in, the, in the article today about the electrician at Boston College, this was with 32BJ of SCIU, um, and there was discussion about that this person wanted an equivalent amount of money contributed to the ASPCA, um, and there's a dispute as to whether the union did, although the union said that when anybody doesn't want to pay their, um, uh, not their agency, agency fees, like, well, except the private sector. It's yeah, private. Agency, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, agency yeah, fee, uh, that they'll allow them to designate a charity. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that as, as an accommodation that that's a, have been That's statutory, that's law in some jurisdictions. Yeah. Okay. So th there's actually one in, in Janus, they cite a California law, I think it is, where that's basically if you, if you have a religious objection, you, I can't remember if the, the part, the union and the employee get to agree on a charity. In one statute, I think the union gets to designate the charity and then the member has to make the contribution to the charity. But in so the public sector, that would be compelled speech. Yeah. If, the, if the union gets to say, you have to contribute to the charity of our choice. Right. I don't think that would survive constitutional. No, I agree. You know. uh, but if you leave it to the individual's choice, then they can give their union, their dues to the national right to work. Yeah, you know, we're not making that accommodation for anyone, whether it's religious or political, whatever your reasons are. It's like, sorry, it used to be an agency fee that was taken away. Join membership, and if you don't join membership, there are a whole host of things that we will not do for you. You know, that we don't have to do for you because they're not within the scope of the duty of fair representation. Like, for example, representing people in discrimination cases, representing people in retirement cases, representing before the ethics commission. We provide lawyers for all of those kinds of things. Um, but not if you're a non-member. You know, and there's a million other things that I can mention yeah, that are non legal. That's what we're doing. Um, none of which really involves the employer other than, you know, you know, it's it's a little simpler. You know, there's no agency fee. The only thing that yeah. does involve the employer is dues deduction. And we've, right. had, and we've had problems in that area. Right. Where employers are saying, well, if someone wants the statute now says it's no longer a 30 day notice period or 60 day, whatever it was, can't you remember? 60. 60 day. It's now, if you're, if you're, um, if when someone signs a membership agreement, it says, uh, the, the membership agreement says up to a year, the employer can't drop the pay, you know, dues deduction for up to a year. It's like any membership at any association. If you join for the year and the terms are very clear that you can't quit in the middle of the year, 
you're in. And so whether, you know, and so we've had problems with uh, some employers who have said, well, we think that's unconstitutional, so we're not gonna, we're not gonna do it. I wouldn't recommend it because we will go to court. You know, we will sue saying that it's, it's perfectly constitutional what the legislature did. Um, and, um, and you're actually now interfering with our rights as a union for an employer to say, we're, we're gonna stop, we're not gonna abide by this new statute. Uh, I'll even name the employer, it was the University of Massachusetts. Stunning, you know, big system like that saying we're, you know. Now we didn't have to make people drop it, so it wasn't really a problem. But we took a very strong stand and said, we'll be in court on Monday if you don't back off of this notion that you're gonna stop the dues deduction. Dues deduction is well, a, ba is a battleground. Well, I feel like that's a different subject from Janice. Yeah, it is. So that's like, again, I think a little bit. Yeah, but it's all part of the response well, to yeah. Janice that we're protecting dues deduction we're, and we're strengthening it and making it so that there is a, a little more economic security. Um, in the brief that got filed today by the National Right to Work, they mentioned the statute and they say, oh, look what the legislature's done, they're already, you know. So, you know, it's, it's a target to get for the right way. Any questions? Oh, yes. Has anybody thought about unions only representing members and not everybody? You know, we'll yes. go on strike and they're the only ones who get vacations and stuff. Yes, that's the, um, that would be the end of exclusive representation. Yes. And, that, and it, it does exist in other countries um, and even in some other states. It's nothing that, um, but it's, there was a lot of uh, debate about that among the unions. Um, but a very, very strong opposition to the notion of only representing the people who want to join the union, because then the people who don't join the union can, can go out and either negotiate their own terms and conditions of employment, or they can join another union, and you and it makes it difficult for the, the employer, which should be opposed to that, oh, yeah. because then you're going to be bargaining with, with individuals, with different different unions. Exclusive representation is the is one of the bedrocks of labor law. Uh, and I learned that in Ira Sills at night. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, I was in a different class if you um, <laughs> Ira, you had a question. Um, so, but yes, there was a lot of discussion about it and rejected ultimately. So, a quick question, uh, maybe too big a question though uh, to answer quickly, but uh, your union and the audience may not realize this, but we're the most thoughtful and proactive in dealing with Janus among public sector unions in Massachusetts that I'm familiar with in part because you're well staffed, you have great legal staff, you have connections with all your teachers in school systems or universities where there's leadership in each area, they know the union, it's very visible. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily, and the nurses are similar, have been similar in reacting proactively, I think, to where they have public sector groups. But a lot of the large public sector unions in Massachusetts are the opposite of your model. And there are large statewide bargaining units with 5,000, 10,000 members of state employees. They don't have the same connection. And they haven't been nearly as proactive as the MPA, as your, your organization. I'm wondering if you could comment. There's two different worlds of the public sector, and I've seen them seem to have both have reacted very positively in your case and more passively in some of the other groups. Yeah. Um, you know, I to those other unions, I would say just watch what we do. I mean, invest. This is not the time for austerity. Um, and this is the time to be investing in organizing and hiring people, um, and um, and uh, <coughs> there is some. Uh, I was just talking with someone recently, citing some studies that show that when uh, union dues were raised, and this was in the private sector by some stunning amount, he said nobody dropped. Uh, you know that the that you know people might be more willing to be paying union dues when they have a better understanding of what it is that their dues do for them and, and what it is that their union does for them. What one thing we can't afford any longer in the labor movement is to have large unions that are not engaged directly with the members and educating them about wh why the union does what it does. We can't afford corrupt unions. That was a 1950s issue. You know, that has to stop, you know, because people have to say, I'm gonna go to the union to assist me with this problem, and it doesn't necessarily mean bad things for the employer. No, I don't think so. You know, think that's either, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, a lot of employers, they, they actually filed briefs in favor, of, along with the unions in the Janus case. They were saying, this collective bargaining regime actually works for us, you know. Okay, and then, oh, go ahead. Yeah, it's actually a comment to 
Iris, but I, I think it's in terms of the anticipation of Janus and the res response to Janus that it's not a question of the size of the union. I'm counsel to one of these large statewide unions, but I think we, we were in this, this is an SEIU local, it represents public sector and private sector, but we had to deal with the precursor to Janus in the Harris v. Quinn decision, which basically took away um, agency fees from the so-called quasi-public. So we were dealing with this for years before, but I think it also gets to the concept of how unions view themselves in relation to their members. Are they an insurance agency? Are they just there to pay for service? Are they there to actually get involved with their members and organize their members internally to respond, to get their members actively involved? And I think the statewide unions that have been most fearful of Janus and reacting with the most punitive view, with the desire to sort of react punitively and say, okay, you're gonna have to pay for representation or the unions that view themselves as really having no value to their members other than, well, we're gonna represent you when you get disciplined. And I think that's what's at their peril is that they have a very different concept of what the role is, what the institution is about and what the future of unions is because there is no future in that kind of union. So that's, so I don't think it's the size or statewide because there are some statewide unions that have been, you know, working very much in the exact same way as the MTA. So that's. You had a question? Yeah, um, so this might be too big of a question for the moment, but um, yeah, Ira, when you were first talking about a lot of the legislation that's being brought, you know, this, this just general push to destroy the institution of unions in general. Uh, so it kind of sounds like right now on the union side, it's like this gopher game and you're just knocking, trying to knock down all of these new following this, the steps of Janice. Uh, do you see a way, I guess maybe the answer is various forms of organizing, but to kind of get beyond the gopher game, to get beyond the knocking down various legislation trying to dismantle unions and actually strengthen and build beyond that? Um, again, you know, it's organizing, and part of organizing is also, or, you know, having unions have a, a louder, we have a political voice, getting the right people elected, so that the laws are not as, you know, uh, detrimental to the interests uh, of, of, uh, of working people. Um, the NEA right now is doing this push to try to get lawyers in the area, in labor lawyers, to be uh, union side laborers, to think of about becoming judges. And everyone goes, oh, that's silly. I'm not going to become a judge. <laughs> but how do you, there's so few labor law judges. When we, uh, anyone who appears in the courts knows that the courts don't understand the first yeah, thing about this stuff. I mean, that's true for management and union, where we understand it and we're both, we're all trying to explain to the, you know, to the top court. So getting the judges, to, you know, uh, appointed who are, have them as, uh, who are kind of part of, uh, understand labor issues. Which I might say, the topic of last year's program yeah. with Mary Sullivan and, and Indira Tawani. Oh. Uh, so, uh, Joe, Mary's last a question. perfect example. As, as is Indira. So the, on the statute, I, when Bob Gordon, to be fair. It permits, a, it permits the union to say, we're not gonna bring your grievance into arbitration or appear for you at a grievance proceeding if you don't pay. It allows the unions to have that rule, right? And the unions then have to decide whether or not they want to enforce that or, or have that as part of, you know, it saves them from a DFR claim, but but the, the choice is still there. If the, does the statute contemplate, if the union does have such a rule and says, we're not representing you, does the individual employee then get to hire their own counsel and bring an arbitration? Does the, does the law even contemplate what happens then? Or, or is the employee SOL, you know, it's like, you know, okay, you can't get your your collective bargaining claim of, of non-just cause discharge arbitrated because the union, you won't pay the union to do it for you, but can that employee under the statute say, I'm hiring my own lawyer, and th then the employer is gonna be forced to then uh, do a, a collective bargaining arbitration against some, you know, doofus lawyer who doesn't know what they're doing and potentially screw up language from the collective bargaining agreement create precedent for the whole bargaining agreement. The, the only thing I'd say is that the, the duty of fair representation hasn't changed at all. 
So that when we're looking at a non-member uh, who has a claim under the contract, what I've said to our, all of our unions is, don't even think of member versus non-member. You're, you're defending, the con you're representing the contract. And so even if the person's a non-member, we're gonna do this grievance and we're gonna take it to arbitration, whether they're a member or not. We don't have an arrangement where we're saying to people, you have to pay, otherwise we won't take the case. But the statute and allows that though, right? The statute does permit it. Right. And, and what's um, going to happen? Do you know of any of your... not, uh, The MTA was not in favor of, of that. including that, and we're not going to utilize that right. It's do you there. guys know of anyone who's doing I mean, I'm just curious because yeah. it's going to lead to all sorts of weird I think situations. So. Yeah. Kate, you want to? Well, wanna... I, I mean, I just, yeah, this was a big debate internally. Yes, and this, this provision yeah. in the statute was the result of the compromise that allowed the unions to be able to say to the legislature, okay, we agree. I mean, that was the only way to get it done, basically. But the question you're raising about do, I don't think the statute requires unions to permit individuals to take a case to arbitration. Just like if a union deems a case to be non-meritorious and denies it through some individual proceeding, it doesn't mean that the individual, because the parties are the employer and the union. The individual is not a party whatsoever to the collective bargaining agreement. So, so long as the duty of fair representation is satisfied. So, if they have that rule, if they have that rule, then the employee has no independent right to have their right. discharge or discipline. Right. I think there are some unions that do permit individuals to do that. I mean, uh, the union I represent, we never do. Uh, up to arbitration? Yeah. Wow. Some do. Yes, there are. It happened do. once there in a case and it was the worst some thing do. in the world. I, yeah, think it's, I, I, think, I think it's very, I think it's very <laughs> misguided. <laughs> I think it's very misguided, yeah. but I know that there are some unions that do. Rather than fight it out with them, they would, and you know, if it's a discipline case, I guess they figure, well, this really isn't going to have a wide impact. But, right. Um, yeah. I, I know of unions that that allow it, but it's not, if it's going to be a matter of contract no. interpretation. No, no. Yeah. but it yeah. is, if it's yeah. a question some, of some response, yeah. you know, then yeah, they'll. Good okay, luck. I thank you very much. This was a great start. Yeah, it's, 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 okay. 
No, 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 Traditionally, we've always had Northeast of the Lungs as presenter, um, and Ariel did not have the good fortune to go here, but um, with the powers bestowed upon me as moderator, uh, I've uh, given her a alum person for the night. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you folks decided on uh, the let me go through, Ariel is with Wein uh, Weinstein Roberts, no, it's Hirsch, Hirsch Roberts, Roberts Weinstein, sorry. I love I, Kirk, <laughs> I did a cross quarter with Jerry Weinstein, so I gave him the top bill. Um, and uh, Michael St Stefanillo is with, I'm going to get the orders wrong in that firm too, tell me. Uh, Brody Hardoon Perkins. Brody Hardoon Perkins, a uh, firm with also numbers of Northeastern alums. Jeff Drettler is now with uh, Ruben. Yeah, it's hard to keep up. Yeah. Yes, I know. He keeps, Job his, card, he keeps his card and pencil. Uh -huh. Reuben and Rudman. Reuben and Rudman. At least, uh, at least when I left it. That's <laughs> why. <laughs> <laughs> so, so with that, you folks decided on an order. Please I'm, I'm going to be the lead off uh, batter. Okay, well, uh, good, good evening, everyone. Uh, you know, the, the subject for our panel tonight is a, a this second panel, Evolving Issues in the Workplace in the Courts for LGBTQ and Non-Binary Workers. And there's certainly a lot to talk about. Um, what, I've, what I'm gonna lead off with is uh, a review of a couple of case, three cases, actually a trio of cases that were just argued in the Supreme Court uh, last month. Um, and which no decision has yet been rendered. And I'm gonna sort of give some of the background uh, of those cases and the issue that issues that they present and um, uh, just talk about that a little bit to give a, a framework and then, then we'll move on down the line and, and talk more about, you know, as I'm a management side lawyer, yes, I do represent employers, um, but you know, for, in terms of my, my um, you know, recitation of these cases, I think, I think it's nonpartisan, <laughs> but uh, I'll try. Um, so, so just last, well, to set the stage, as you, as you may or may not know, um, you know, in Massachusetts, uh, Chapter 151B pro prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex, and it also uh, specifically prohibits discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, I took a look at the uh, statute's history, and I believe that if I if I read it correctly, um, in 1989, sexual orientation was added, and in 2011, gender identity was added. So uh, it's really, you know, uh, it's a decided issue. It's a legislative, um, legislatively decided that those are protected classes. Uh, for employment discrimination in Massachusetts. But employees in, uh, around the rest of the country, um, some of them are in states that don't have those kind of protections. Um, there are, uh, I think, 21 states, um, in, plus the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, that have uh, protections similar to the protections granted by Chapter 151B in employment. But that means that more than half the states in the country 
do not. Um, so for, for employees in those states, um, they rely on federal law. I mean, as an as a, as a employment, as a management side uh, employment litigator in Massachusetts, you know, I very often am working with state law because the state law is very protective and oftentimes more protective than the federal law. Sometimes claims are different kind of claims are filed under both laws, but um, it, it's never just the federal law. It's almost always you know the state law and the federal law, if not exclusively. Um, so, so for for the folks in the states that don't have that law, and of course even even for those that do, you know, they're looking to federal law, which is Title VII, and Title VII uh, of the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, prohibits discrimination uh, on the basis of sex. Um, wasn't that the title of the? Uh, yeah. Yeah, the movie. Uh, RBG. Um, but yeah, RBG, which was a great, great movie, I thought, um, on the basis of sex. So you know, what is then? So then, the question now, before the Supreme Court, is, you know, what did the legislate, what did the legislature mean when they passed that law on the basis of sex? Um, what did, what were they talking about when they said sex? Um, did they mean uh, just male or female, um, or did they mean? sexual orientation, gender identity, gender stereotype, etc. The Supreme Court in the Price Waterhouse case um, said that uh, discrimination on the basis of sex does include gender stereotyping. Um, so that is settled law, at least <laughs> seven o'clock tonight. It's yeah, still, to you. <laughs> still settled law at seven o'clock tonight. Um, but, but still the issue is being, being litigated um, as to what are the parameters uh, of that. So the first, the first case that I wanted to, to mention is uh, Altitude Express v. Zarda. Well, that's what it is in the, in the Supreme Court. It was Zarda v. Altitude Express in the lower courts. So in that case, that's, this is a case that deals with uh, the issue of sexual orientation, whether or not uh, Title VII, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex, prohibits discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, per se, not just with the stereotyping, although that becomes relevant, as you'll see. Um, it's part of one of the arguments. So in, in Donald Zarda was a skydiving instructor with Altitude Express, which is on Long Island, I believe. Um, this, is, was a second, this is a case that was decided ultimately by the Second Circuit um, on Bonk and is you know, up, on, up, up on CERT at the Supreme Court. So in the lower court, Donald Zarda, uh, skydiving instructor with Altitude Express, alleges that his employment was terminated after he told a female client that he was gay. Uh, and the boyfriend of the client, who was, who was also a client, and they were doing, um, the, the, the boyfriend and girlfriend went skydiving together um, with Altitude Express, and after they got down, uh, they, the boyfriend complained to Altitude Express that Zarda had, um, well, they said he had touched uh, his girlfriend inappropriately. He also complained that you know he had said he was gay and talked about his um, relationship that he had, had just broken up, and the employer fired Zarda. Um, according to the employer, the employer fired Zarda because this was sort of the last straw of a lot of customer complaints, and it wasn't, you know, because he was gay, but because, you know, we don't want customers complaining, and you know, you're out, you're out of here. Um, Zarda sued uh, under Title VII, um, saying that, you know, the reason he was fired was because he had disclosed uh, that he was gay. And now that the employer knows he's gay, the employer uh, fired him, and that was because of his sex. Well, in the district court, the Eastern District of New York, uh, Zarda argued that it violates uh, Title VII uh, because he failed to conform to sexual stereotypes. And he argued, uh, he gave some facts that um, uh, Sorry, I 
lost my train of thought here. But he, he said it, it failed, it, he was failing to conform to sexual stereotypes because one of the stereotypes is, is you know, who you should be in a relationship with. Um, and he cited you know, the Price Waterhouse case. He was basically relying on that argument. Oh, he also said that the employer had um, criticized him for wearing pink at work and for painting his toenails pink and that these were you know, things that the employer um, viewed as not something that you know, a male skydiving instructor should, should do. Uh, the district court awarded summary judgment to the employer, uh, District, Eastern District of New York, on the Title VII claim um, because just on the basis that Title VII does not prohibit discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, but the court did not even perform the, the Price Waterhouse analysis. Um, the case then, the, Zarda had also brought a, another claim under New York state law, um, which does prohibit uh, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. And so there was summary judgment dismissing the Title VII claim, but not dismissing the state claim. So the state claim went to trial. Um, sorry, I'm going through puberty, so my voice is cracking. <laughs> <laughs> went to trial. Um, the, um, the, the jury came back for the employer. Um, and then there was an appeal. Um, uh, oh, I think, uh, sorry, forgot one thing on the, on the procedure. Um, Let me see. Uh, oh, dur during during these during these proceedings, uh, as the case was moving up um, uh, into in the to the um, the appeals court, the EEOC issued a decision in Baldwin v. Fox. Um, was July 16, 2015, and in Baldwin v. Fox, which I'll talk about in a minute, the EEOC declared that. Uh, Title VII does protect, uh, prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation. And um, so that was an intervening uh, you know, decision. And I believe that Zarda asked, you know, and he, and he raised that um, in the appeal to the Second Circuit to the three judge panel. Uh, the three judge panel said, uh, we don't have authority to overturn prior uh, Second Circuit uh, decisions that say that Title VII does not uh, cover sexual orientation. So they didn't address the issue on the three-judge panel, but they did address um, some of the other alleged errors at, at trial um, otherwise. Um, Zarda asked, uh, submitted to have the case heard on Bonk uh, by the whole Second Circuit, who, who agreed to, which agreed to take the case. Um, and the Second Circuit ended up uh, reversing uh, the summary judgment. And the Second Circuit en banc ruling, which was issued in 2018, and the, the majority opinion was written by Judge Katzman, who interestingly, and, it, and it's, a, it's a tremendous opinion, I, I encourage you to take a look at it. It's, um, long and very well reasoned in my in my view, um, Katzman. If you don't know, is the brother, twin brother of uh, Gary Katzman, who's on the appeals court here. So we have a connection there, and uh, you've got a connection there too. You? Yes. <laughs> um, so the uh, uh, the on banc ruling um, by the six by the second circuit said. Um, you know, it is, it is well settled uh, that gender stereotyping violates Title VII's uh, prohibition on discrimination because of sex. And in the past, prior Second Circuit cases have held uh, that sexual orientation just claims, though, are not cognizable under Title VII. And Judge Katzman said that was before the EEOC decided the Baldwin v. Fox case and before some other circuits and other courts around the country had issued some decisions and Katzman said, but legal doctrine evolves and went on 
to explain that now he, they find that Title VII does uh, prohibit discrimination on the base, basis of sexual orientation. Oh, it was it went, went an interesting, and I'll, I'll go into that in a little more detail in a minute, but just one, one interesting note is that the first issue that the, the uh, Second Circuit had to deal with was whether or not um, they had jurors, whether there was a case or controversy before them because the, the, the state law claim had gone forward to trial and the jury had found for the defendant. So, so the employer argued, you know, this is moot now because the jury has already decided there was no discrimination. So even if there could have been a claim under Title VII for sexual orientation discrimination, there's not one here, so what's the, what's the point? You don't issue an advisory opinion you know, on, on the subject. Um, if I might, I think, skip some of the procedure. Okay, <laughs> so at any rate, the, the, court, the court made, uh, uh, said that the, the standard of proof was different under the state court, the, the state law than the federal law, and therefore um, it was not a moot issue in that they should, because the jury inst was instructed a certain way, they might, a different jury instructed a different way, might decide differently. Um, so the court, the Sixth Circuit held in that case uh, that on a, on a number of different grounds as to why um, sexual orientation uh, discrimination was prohibited under Title VII. They said um, because sexual orientation um, defined by, is defined by one's sex in relationship to the sex of those to whom one is attracted. And that that is, it's, it's that it, sexual orientation is um, because of sex, because the sex relates to, you know, what sex person is, are you attracted to? It also said that, uh, uh, reaffirmed the s sexual orientation on the base of stereotypes. It also said that there was uh, sexual orientation discrimination um, is prohibited by Title VII because it uh, v violates uh, the, the uh, right to association, that it's, you're discriminating against somebody because of who they're associating with. And it also, um, and they mentioned a different way of the, of the stereotyping. So the, um, the court um, vacated the, the decision and now you know, it's up at the Supreme Court and uh, it was argued in conjunction with another case, Bostock versus Clayton County, Georgia from the 11th Circuit. And in that case, uh, a child welfare worker appealed a lower court's dismissal of a claim um, for discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Um, he had been discharged uh, after he, uh, his coworkers, uh, and, bought and employer learned he was gay. He said there were critical remarks made about um, him being on a, soft, a gay softball team um, and sued under Title VII. The district court um, dismissed it on a motion to dismiss. And the 11th Circuit um, affirmed the dismissal based on precedent in the 11th Circuit. And so those are just opposite, res opposite results. You know, a circuit split, a complete, complete different decision by the two circuits, and so they were argued together. Um, the, the third case had to do with um, <coughs> uh, gender identity. It's RG and GR Harris Funeral Homes versus EEOC. And in that case, uh, Amy Stevens is an employee who was born biologically male. Um, she was fired shortly after informing the owner that she intended to transition uh, from male to female and would begin representing herself and dressing as a woman at work at the funeral home. Um, the funeral home, well, I'll skip some of the procedural history, but there was, um, there was a lot of procedural history in this case as to whether what kind of arguments were being made and what kind of arguments were going to be going forward. Um, ultimately, 
at, at summary judgment. Uh, there were cross motions for summary judgment. Uh, the, district, the district court on summary judgment uh, found in favor of the funeral home as to the claim for wrongful termination under Title VII. Interestingly, the, uh, the, the lower court on summary judgment found that um, there, that there was um, a prohibition again, that the, the sexual stereotyping arguments could be used to um, argue for that, uh, that Title VII prohibited discrimination against a transgender person, but that the funeral home had a defense, and the defense was the Religious uh, Freedom Restoration Act. And the funeral home, uh, the 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 um, lower court found that, and under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, there's a burden shifting um, scenario where the the employer uh, first says that you know having to employ uh, this transgender person burdens uh, my uh, practice of my religion because I you know, I'm comforting people here who are grieving, you know, their, their, their um, you know, family members and, you know, it's, in, it's inconsistent with my religion to have them dressing differently than their biological, um, uh, than their biology. Um, and then it was the burden of the EEOC to say, essentially, well, never, even, even though the employer has shown or has made an argument that there's a, a substantial burden on them, you know, can the EEOC show that, um, that they have a compelling interest in eliminating the discrimination notwithstanding the, the um, burden and that they're doing so by the least restrictive means. The lower court found that the EEOC failed to prove that it was doing, uh, that it was um, alleviating the discrimination by the least restrictive means. There was a dress code issue, and um, there was a specific requirement that men dress a certain way and women dress a certain way, and the object, the funeral home was saying, no, we're not gonna let you know, someone who's biologically male dress in a way other than how we require biological males to dress. The, uh, the lower court judge said, no, the EEOC could have you know, forced this employer to um, have a new dress code, like a, um, a, a, a um, one that doesn't distinguish between men and women, that there was a less restrictive way to enforce um, their interest. Uh, the Sixth Circuit um, said no. No. and basically found for the employee across the board. Um, the Sixth Circuit uh, awarded summary judgment to EEOC, said the funeral home <coughs> engaged in unlawful discrimination, um, and basically came out the other way on the balance. Uh, they rejected the, def the religious um, uh, defense and found in favor of the employee. So uh, those are essentially the three cases that were uh, you know, up argued at the Supreme Court. Um, I went and listened to the oral arguments. You can go to the Supreme Court website and listen to the arguments. They're about an hour and some each. Um, it'll make your head spin to do it. The, the various arguments that are made as to what is because of sex and what isn't because of sex. Um, and um, I'll, I guess I'll stop there because it's kind of droned on for a while, but uh, well, we'll, I have more things to say. We'll do it on the flip, okay. flip side. Who's next? <coughs> next? So thank you for coming. Uh, a little different being on this side than <laughs> sitting up there. I haven't been back since I graduated. So, uh, <laughs> people are a lot closer than <laughs> you know, When you came in to sit here as a student, you sat towards the back. You felt like there was a really a lot of distance between you and the professor. There really isn't. <laughs> you pretty much see everything that everyone's doing. So. <laughs> um, I'm going to speak a little bit more uh, from on the ground level. Um, I do both employer and employee side 
or <coughs> employer side in, in the municipal context and then employee side in the, in the private sphere. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on my plaintiff's work um, as both of my colleagues uh, do employer, employer side discrimination cases. So uh, this past year, you know, the, the panel name is evolving issues in the workplace. So this past year, I've had two plaintiffs' cases that I've handled, uh, essentially very similar fact patterns with uh, non-binary employees. And um, both of them uh, centered around the election of preferred pronouns in the workplace. Uh, so uh, I'll focus on one of the cases since they're factually somewhat similar. Um, my client was initially uh, started working at a corporation as an entry level professional employee. Uh, at that time, they had not disclosed to their employer uh, that they identified as non-binary. And so at the beginning of their employ, uh, they were referred to by their supervisor and coworkers uh, using pronouns that matched their physical appearance, which also happened to be biological sex of male. So the supervisor was referring to my client as he and, or him, uh, as were his coworkers or their coworkers. At some point after a few months of working uh, for the company, they felt comfortable enough to essentially disclose to the employer and to their coworkers that they identified as non-binary and that their preferred pronouns were they and them. Um, it was attempt to permanent position uh, when they started and uh, they were told prior to this disclosure that they were on track to be made permanent when the position was to change over in a, in a few months. Um, so after the disclosure, of course, things changed. The supervisor for whom my client worked directly at times attempted to use the preferred pronouns, um, but at other times took the position that it was too difficult and that it was not something that the supervisor was used to doing, and so it was uncomfortable for the supervisor to do. And, and, and I'll get to this a, a little later. It, it's interesting, the defense on bo in both cases really wasn't that we don't have to do it or that the law doesn't compel us to, to do it. It was that we're, we're trying. And what was interesting about dealing with defense counsel on, on the other side of both cases in, in settlement discussions was that I cannot think of another protected class where we're trying would be an acceptable thing. <laughs> and yet, it was the defense advance in, at the agency level in writing. <coughs> and the defense really was, listen, this supervisor is X years old. They're of a different generation. They're not used to doing this. The pronouns that your client wants the supervisor to use are traditionally plural pronouns, which makes it difficult for the supervisor to use them. It's uncomfortable in speech. Uh, it's not natural to them, but they're trying to do it. And as long as they're trying, that then it's not illegal. Uh, you know, going off of, of some of what Jeff was talking about, you know, from the plaintiff's perspective, we have a pretty comprehensive law under 151B when I'm bringing a claim uh, on for sexual orientation discrimination or gender identity discrimination, you always sue under the state law as well as the federal law if you're going to bring a federal law claim at all because the state law is obviously more comprehensive than Title VII as we just discussed. Uh, sometimes you'll bring the Title VII claim as well so you can be in federal court with one judge uh, the entire time or Food's nicer than these nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, with my client, uh, after <coughs> the disclosure, things started to get uh, uh, uncomfortable for them, and they wanted to put a sign, kind of, you know, like this, where they wrote they, them on the sign and put it at their 
you know, cubicle so that the supervisor would be reminded to use the proper pronouns when addressing them. And the supervisor took offense to the sign and found it to not only be distracting but insulting of his efforts and intelligence. Um, and so he had my client take the sign down. When it was time to transition the, peer, the position from attempt to permanent, uh, the company decided to go in a different direction, not surprising, <laughs> and did not transition them to a permanent employee and hired somebody else. So uh, we filed a charge that at that point, my client sought legal assistance. After that had happened, uh, they were resourceful and they had already found another job. So, um, one thing that I think is important in this discussion, because this is, a, is an involving issue, this was a really important to my client was that this was not just about money, because they had found another job pretty quickly. So the damages were mitigated, and the, and the lost wages or the wage claim really wasn't. Uh, you know, what made up the bulk of this case. It was important to them that whatever agreement was reached should be reached an agreement, include some type of restorative piece. And I, and I think that we've gotten to a point where these types of issues really are going to start popping up more and more as a younger generation of workers don't identify as cisgender. And, and as that happens, the, these type of accommodation issues, whether it be pronoun, preference, uh, bathrooms, or, or other, are really going to start making their way into litigation. And, and so um, my client was really passionate about there being a training component to any settlement that was reached with the employer and also that this employer make a donation to an organization of my client's choosing who works with uh, transgender. <coughs> um, so we filed the charge at the MCAD. Like I said, I received a position statement that, you know, I, I personally found it a little shocking uh, to take the position that we tried. I thought it gave me a good bargain. <coughs> I was, was a little surprised that was, that was the employer's defense. But, but I do think doing employer side work that we are going to see a lot of that type of defense, maybe more you know, in a more articulate way. But you know, it being said that this is difficult and when an employer supervisor messes up using the, the, this you know, individuals preferred pronoun. It's not that they're discriminating against them. It's that this is an uncomfortable situation that, that the employer is not used to, and, and it's difficult for them. Um, and the employers should be punished every single time a supervisor makes a mistake. Michael, um, what I, I can grasp the defense on the linguistic aspects of it, but what did they? suggest was the defense as to why they denied the person the permanent position. Because they didn't, that's not a we tried, that's a we did it to them. Yeah, yeah so um, that was a, that, the defense on that issue was essentially similar to what I find a lot of my plaintiff's cases end up being, no matter what the protected class is, and it's suddenly somebody who had no performance issues is a terrible employee. Um, I see that a lot, right? Uh, um, and most of the time it's not well documented. Uh, it's, you know, these, these incidents just come popping out of the woodwork that, you know, back in August, they did a really terrible job on this project that I gave them. Of course, I never sat down with them and told them anything about it, but it's always been in the back of my mind and when it came time to transition the position, um, I couldn't let go of that issue. Uh, that, that was kind of where the employer went with that. The, the employer had a problem. This employer knew they had a problem with this case. 
Uh, so I think from the beginning, we were engaged in pretty fruitful settlement discussions about how we could uh, resolve this to, to the benefit of both parties involved. And again, because my client had gotten another job, what was important to them was that this company didn't do what they did to them to someone else. Was the failure, I'm not, sorry, I'm not the moderator, but <laughs> it was the failure to use the correct pronoun uh, you offered as evidence of discriminatory intent in the termination or sort of as a hostile work environment claim in and of itself? Well, I allege both claims. We allege both claims. Um, <laughs> as any good plaintiff lawyer would. <laughs> Um, you know, my client was, was not someone who, he's, they were very, very tolerant of the accidental misgendering by the supervisor. It was months of misgendering that became a problem for them. And the sign, the refusal for the supervisor to let them have a sign up. That, you know, this was not something that they disclosed to the supervisor, um, and then after a week said, <coughs> "This guy screwed it up five times. Let's file a claim." Right? It wasn't until you know months of this had happened, and then I think the the uh, not giving them the permanent position after telling them that they're on track to get it was pretty much what. The straw that broke the camel's back in this in this in this instance. Um, so you probably had a retaliation claim too because they asserted their rights to be called by the gender that they preferred, and then they were fired because of it. Of course, right. <laughs> <laughs> you could do it. Well, yeah. 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 Well, yeah, you know the claim. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we ended up reaching a resolution in both cases. In the case that I've been talking about, there was a uh, restorative piece to the settlement that included that the company, and this is a big company, uh, would do company-wide sensitivity training as to uh, non-binary and transgender employees, specifically. And so, I think, I think, you know, as the subject of the panel again, that this type of accommodation issue is going to keep coming up more and more as we, uh, a new generation of workers uh, enter the workforce where more and more individuals are not identifying as cisgender. And I think what we'll also see are better defenses than we tried. Um, but I think what some of those defenses may be are what you touched upon, and, and that is going to be in the private sector, freedom of speech type defenses, that the employer is free to choose not to call the employee by their preferred pronouns, and also certainly religious-based defenses. I haven't run into those yet, but I can't fathom that as this becomes more, you know, goes, becomes more of a forefront issue that those defenses aren't raised by some employer in some, in some way, uh, even in the context of a 151B state law case. Thank you. All right. All right, and I, I know I stand between everybody in the reception, so I will try to um, try to speak uh, briefly, and I'm always happy to hang out afterward and talk to anybody else on um, those questions. Uh, just very quick background of me, I'm an employer side lawyer, um, but I have developed a, a practice in doing advising and training specifically for employees about, employers uh, about transgender and non-binary workers. Um, and I write and I speak a lot in this area. So um, it's, it's kind of an interesting position to be in. And I was very glad that Michael was on the panel because um, I, it's great to hear from plaintiff's attorneys. Um, it's also really interesting because as 
Michael was explaining this case, um, it, it, the facts are like nearly identical to um, several cases I've had on the employer side that involve this issue of um, somebody's proper pronouns. Um, and it's so interesting because this idea of um, a supervisor saying, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, I can't get it, it's too hard, I, you know, it's, it's a plural pronoun. You hear these things come up over and over, um, and in both of those cases, I will say, um, they also settled, and we had to settle it because it's not really a defense. It's not a good defense. Um, so it's, it's one thing that we talk a lot about when we do training um, for employers is, if somebody tells you their pronouns, use their pronouns. It's not up for debate, um, and it's not up for kind of, uh, sometimes we get these kind of like grammar debates. And the amazing thing that's happened recently is I think um, the New York Times, the APA, the OED, all of these like, the like, the grand guardians of grammar um, have come out and said, plural pronoun they, or you know, singular pronoun they, we're, we're into it, we accept it, and that's a great, that's actually a great thing that I've used with employers to say, hey, everybody's doing this. Um, you can do it too. Um, and then one like very practical thing I'll share about that, um, and I, I'm straight up stealing this from Mason Dunn, who was the uh, executive director of the Mass Transgender Political Coalition for a long time. He said this in a training, and I was like, that's an amazing idea. It sounds so simple. Um, but if you have an employee who um, is using a different pronoun, or you have an employee who comes in and is using they, them pronouns, and you don't know anybody who uses they, them pronouns, practice. So um, as you're driving to work, um, say, I'm going to uh, speak with Joe today, and I'm going to give them their performance review. Say it out loud, say it in your head, write it down, practice it. Um, put it on yourself to learn to use those pronouns. Um, and, and it actually, it really works. Um, so that's something I share with employers a lot. I like to just share it in general, um, with thanks to Mason. Uh, Michael talked a little bit about the, kind of the changing demographics and the generational change that we're seeing. And I actually looked up um, a recent poll and was kind of blown away by it. Um, so in terms of people who identify as transgender, among 18 to 34 year olds, uh, that, that number is 2%. Among 35 to 51 year olds, the number is 1%. And among 52 to 71 year olds, it's about 0.5%. Um, and I actually was tempted to draw it up there because it's a, almost a perfect curve, right? It's in every generational cohort, it doubles. Now, the same thing happens when you ask about people who identify as gender fluid, bi gender, and <coughs> gender queer. For some reason in this poll, they didn't use non-binary as the term, but it's, it's kind of um, these umbrella terms. So similar, among 18 to 34 year olds, 5% of individuals identify with those uh, identities. Among 35 to 51 year olds, that number goes down by half to 2.5, and among 52 to 71 year olds, again, goes down by half to 1%. So we sort of see this trend that in every generation, um, we are doubling the number of people who identify as transgender, um, gender fluid, non-binary, um, one of those identities. And I just kind of know anecdotally that in the next generation, which I think they're calling Z now, I think that probably is at least doubling, if not more. Um, and we just see the trend. I do a lot of work on college and university campuses, and it, it certainly seems like that generation really is embracing those identities. Um, so the takeaway for me as an employment lawyer is that the way that people are identifying themselves in public is changing. Um, that might be a result of how people are understanding themselves, or it might be a result of um, less stigma and more acceptance of those identities. Either way, as a practical matter, what that means is that in the workplace, you are going to have people uh, who identify as transgender, who identify as non-binary, non working alongside people who don't know anybody who identifies transgender or non-binary, um, who maybe don't know what the terms mean, who, don't, um, who aren't comfortable with it. And that is the recipe for workplace conflict, and 
is the recipe for discrimination claims, and it's the recipe for all kinds of, all the things that we want to avoid as employer side lawyers and, and as plaintiff lawyers as well. So that's kind of the framework that I look at this issue from, um, and it informs my work with employers. I want to just say a couple of things about Chapter 151B, and, and um, Michael and Jeff will talk about them. Um, but as, as Michael said, gender identity is a protected class um, under 151B, so discrimination is prohibited on the basis of gender identity. What a lot of times people ask is, like, what does that mean? What does gender identity mean, and how does it? How do you prove it out um, in litigation? And I want to emphasize two things. First of all, the term gender identity is incredibly broad. Um, it includes all um, the term is sincerely held gender identities. It's not limited to male and female in the statute. It's not identified sort of in any way in the statute. Um, and one really important thing is that there's no litmus test for gender. There's no litmus test for transition. Um, some people sometimes say, well, you know, so-and-so says they're transgender, but they didn't get the surgery. Um, and, you know, that's problematic on a, a lot of <laughs> levels. Um, but there's no litmus test. It is, it is your sincerely held gender identity. Um, and we like to talk about transition broadly um, social transition, legal transition, medical transition, surgical transition. Um, and the bottom line for employers is, if someone says, this is who I am, we don't get to ask. <laughs> and we should not ask, and we absolutely should draw a hard line on that. Um, so I always like to mention that when I'm talking about this topic. Um, the issue of non-binary employees and, and sort of the legal status of non-binary employees is, is really interesting from a legal perspective, I think. Um, I, I try this once in a while. I put into Westlaw like any variation of non-binary um, and genderqueer and uh, various other terms that I can come up with. And I still, like, I tried it again yesterday because I was like, maybe this time. Um, nothing. There's, to my knowledge, there's no case law on, on whether and to what extent non-binary individuals are protected under the law. Um, the MCAD has issued a gender identity guidance. There's no mention of non-binary identities. Um, the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office has also issued guidance. Um, the only kind of quasi mention is that it says that places of public accommodation are not required to build gender neutral and or sex facilities. Um, but that's very sort of facility oriented uh, specific and again, doesn't get into this idea. So in one sense, the law's really behind on this. And we don't have a lot of like concrete guidance on it. In other ways, the law is kind of, it's moving on this, right? And I think the biggest way to see that is to look at the recent um, decision by the, the Registry of Motor Vehicles to allow a gender designation of X on driver's license and ID cards. So we can now have non-binary um, identification cards, which is, it, it's huge. So, this is an area where things are like simultaneously moving really fast and really slow, and for employers and for employees, that causes um, that causes a certain level of uncertainty, right, um, and, and dislocation. But in terms of like as a practical matter, um, and I, I just can't emphasize this enough, when I'm talking to employers, um, I emphasize a couple things. Again, when somebody tells you that they identify in a certain way. Case closed. That's how they identify. And at that point, it is our obligation to uh, respect that identity to the, to the extent possible. In most cases, somebody's gender identity just simply doesn't bear on their work at all. Like in 99.5%. Um, and, and you know, the only time I think it could come into play is where you have like a bona fide occupational qualification based on sex, and that, especially in Massachusetts, is exceedingly rare. Otherwise, their gender identity just doesn't matter to their work, right? Let's talk about performance, let's talk about issues like that, um, and respect who they are in terms of gender identity. Um, and I, I do want to tell a quick story about that, which is I worked with a, a manufacturing client um, 
not the most progressive of clients mm. in, in, in lots of ways. Very good hearted, but like not kind of like hip to um, the, the most progressive um, of points of view. And I got a call from them and they said, you know, we've got a, an employee who just said that they're transgender and we have all these problems with them and we need your help and we have to, you know, like, we kind of want to get this person out of here. And I'm being very frank about that. Um, and I said, all right, well, like, let's slow down and, and talk about what's really going on. And once we had a conversation about what was happening, what it really came down to is that they were concerned because this employee was wearing um, like kind of big jewelry, uh, big like dangling bracelets. And in a manufacturing facility, it was legitimately dangerous to do that. And nobody was allowed to do that. Um, and so we talked about, well, address that issue. Like go ahead and, and talk to the employee and say, you can't wear X, Y, Z thing. Um, and nobody's allowed to do it. And once we kind of like worked through some of the like concern about, oh my God, there's this thing that I don't understand, there's this person who's saying this thing that I don't understand. We were able to kind of get to like, let's talk about the performance issue and deal with that, or it's not really a performance issue, but um, let's, let's kind of deal with the, the actual safety issue um, and then work on making sure this person feels respected and welcome in the workplace. Um, and, and ultimately they were able to make it work. Um, so I'm going to stop there, though I, I love talking about this topic. I'm happy to hang out afterward. I'm sure these guys are as well. Um, thank you for uh, the honorary, um, the honor of being here tonight. I really appreciate it. If we're not, if, do we have any, are we done or are we, because I'd love to share one thing if I could. Go ahead. From the, to, to, just to um, switch hats from the uh, Supreme Court uh, recitation, which I'm no Supreme Court scholar, but I am a workaday management side lawyer, and I did have um, the opportunity a few years ago, really it's like two years ago, to, to work with a client uh, manufacturing, but it was a not like, uh, well, small, uh, it was, um, anyway, it doesn't matter, it was a manufacturing client who had an employee that was a software engineer there, had been there about five years, and was an excellent employee, and this employer was, was more progressive and willing to do whatever it needed to do. That employee came, told HR, um, I'm just gonna make up, make up the name and say that the employee's name was Mike. And he basically said, I'm, I'm Mike, but I'm really Michelle inside, and I'm gonna, on Monday, I'm gonna be Michelle outside, <laughs> and um, I wanna talk to you about how that's gonna be. Um, and, and it wasn't just like Friday that he mentioned it, but. No, it was like two weeks maybe before, and so I got a frantic call from HR saying, what do we do? You know, what do we do about the other, you know, not like, do, we, there was no interest in firing the person, but what, what, what should we say or what should we not say to the other employees? You know, is it going to be a shock when the person that they've all known as Mike comes in on Monday with, and, and says, you know, she would like to be referred to as Michelle for here on out, and she's wearing female clothing and sits back down at what was Mike's desk, et, et cetera. Um, and th this employer really wanted to, to work on it, and, and fortunately, the employee was also very cooperative. So what we did, you know, is I encouraged the HR person to, to speak very directly and frankly, with the employee about the situation, find out what they felt comfortable um, sharing, what they, you know, what they didn't want to share, etc. And the HR person ended up having um, meetings with small groups of people on that employee's team. Um, it wasn't like a big announcement. It wasn't like a company-wide announcement or a big company meeting with you know 200 people there that would have embarrassed you know the person, etc. Just but just wrap, wrapping up anyway, you know, the, the employer um, dealt with it by, t by in, in communication with the employee, um, sensitive to those, that employee's um, desires and needs, and you know, spoke to the individuals on that team and created in advance a supportive environment, and it worked out very, very well. Um, and, you yeah, know, so far so good uh, on that one. And I think, um, you know, and I had to prep the HR person for what kind of, what, you know, what are you gonna, uh, the questions, well, what about the bathroom usage? 
stuff like that, you know. And, and the employer took the position that, that this employee uses the bathroom that they identify with. And if the other employees come to HR and say, well, that makes us uncomfortable, either A, too bad, or there, there was a unisex bathroom like on another floor and you can invite them to use, the other employees to use that one if they wish. That's how they did it. So. Great, well, I thank you very much. This is incredibly interesting. I hope we have more discussions outside at the reception and thank you all for coming. Aggressive one. My, my arbitration was definitely five years. Ago.